Hi, everyone. Dr. Tim here with Hillary for another session of the Dr. Tim's Aquatics podcast. How are you doing this morning, Hillary? I am doing good. This is exciting that we have enough questions to do two Q&A podcasts back to back. Oh, we have a lot of questions, which is nice. Okay. Everybody's out there. We're here to help. Um, so let's get started. Okay. All right. Question number one. I just got a tank and I'm going to be using well water along with your aqua cleanse. I will run it through a filter first to remove and reduce the TDS, but will it be safe to use in my tank? So, um, well water, I'm assuming it's, you're getting it straight from the well, don't you think, Hillary? So there's no, there's no chlorine, there's no chloramine, there's no ammonia maybe no ammonia in well water. I did a project out in Venezuela long, long, long time ago where they wanted to put a shrimp farm and the groundwater was full of ammonia. So, uh, um, I think too, like you can test the water, but when you like, you can do have like a company come out and test the well and they should be able to give you a readout of the, what your water looks like. I think. Right. So, I wouldn't just add aqua cleanse or, or any chemical to, to your water until you know what you're trying to do, as in you're trying to get rid of ammonia, you're trying to get rid of chlorine, you're trying to get rid of chloramine. Um, generally, for well water, my first go-to would be first defense because you don't have, you know, if you had any chlorine or chloramines, which is very doubtful, the first defense will get rid of that. Um, ammonia would be treated, uh, we're going to assume there isn't any ammonia. So the first defense then has some uh, vitamins and immunostimulant to help treat the fish. So you kind of get a two-in-one thing. Um, either way, both of them are fine to use and they're safe with your fish. Um, I'm not sure the filter you're using to remove TDS because that would be like an ion exchange. And why would you want to remove the TDS unless you're well water? TDS, for those who don't know, I should, uh, total dissolved solids, which in most fresh water is calcium and magnesium, which constitutes what makes up water hardness. And most fish like hard water and nitrifying bacteria definitely like hard water. Um, So I'm not sure why you would want to remove that. Um, You probably want to keep it on, keep it in there. So uh, in in an ion exchange resin, uh, the only reason you want to make soft water is if you have South American tetras or things like that. And as I've mentioned a few times, I would cycle the tank with the harder water first because the nitrifying bacteria will establish and grow faster and then start replacing it with the soft water because the nitrifiers are going to work slower when uh, in that soft water. That makes sense. And if you are in doubt, make sure, like, please be testing your water as you go along. Like, Don't just blindly add water or you know, put additives in your water. Test your water to see. Yeah, that's so that's a, yeah, that's an important part, Hillary. Thanks for bringing that up. You know, it's don't make assumptions about your water, especially if this is your first tank. Um, test it, and then or it, it, say you don't have well water. What do you do? All cities in or are in a water district, and that water district by law has to have an annual water quality report. And that, that you can download from the web and it'll give you an idea. Do you live in soft water? Do you, an area with soft water? Do you live in an area with hard water? What's your alkalinity pH? Um, and then that will give you an idea what kind of things you're going to need to add to the water, subtract to the water. Or if you don't even want to mess with that, it'll give you an idea of what kind of fish. If you have naturally soft water, that's great for Tetris. You can go with that. I just know that it's going to take a little uh, while to cycle. So it'll it'll save you some aggravation um, if you know, as Hillary just mentioned, what's in your water first. Yep. 
and you know, it's interesting that you say that I didn't, I guess I should have assumed that the city had something like that, but I don't know that I would have thought to go look for it. So if you haven't, definitely. Yeah, and, it, and it may not be in the city, like down here where I am, it's not the, you know, city of Simi Valley or city Moore Park. It's the water district because the water district can goes over, you know, it's, it spans many cities. So it might be that you have to just look for your local water district. Yep. Okay. Good question. Number two, I've been running bio pellets now on a 280 gallon system for nine months. I have 64 ounces of pellets in my reactor with the out tied to the skimmer. The pellets still look new as the day I put them in. I did have an algae bloom about two weeks after adding them and had to use the UV to clear it up, but still the UV is off and no consumption of the pellets. Would waste away help? Thanks. Well, first off, I don't recommend tying the output of your pellet reactor to your skimmer because that puts back pressure on the system. And it, to me, it makes it harder to control the water flow and the flow rate of the pellets. Plus, especially if you're uh, running, if you have lots of coral in your tank, converting the nutrients um, into bacterial biomass that grows on the pellets and then that the biomass um, sloughs off. So let's, you know, what are bio pellets? Bio pellets are biodegradable carbon. They're in a, a reactor and they slowly churn, they slowly move and they become both a substrate, a surface for heterotrophic bacteria to grow on. And those bacteria get the carbon they need from the bio pellet. And then they remove the nitrate and phosphate from the water. They assimilate it, meaning they, they grow. They use it to grow more bacteria. And that usually is a, is a biomass. And because the pellets are turning and rubbing against each other, that biomass wears off, which is what we want, because it breaks off and then can be removed by the skimmer, thereby removing the nitrates and phosphates. Or another big benefit is it can be ingested by the corals. Corals love bacterial biomass, and that will help keep your corals healthy and more colorful. So you kind of, I don't like tying the output of the bioreactor into directly into the skimmer. Um, now to the specific question, the waste away will help, but what we're missing here is what's the nitrates and phosphates. Because to get to for a bio pellet to reactor to work, the idea behind those, as I just mentioned, nit getting rid of nitrates and phosphates. But if you're using GFO and you're using a refugia and you're kind of doing the Swiss Army filtration method where you've got everything in the system, most everything is not going to work well. That's, you know, you've got to kind of pick the, the system. That, that you're going to use and let that develop. Um, so even adding the waste away at this point, it should help, but it can, it, can we guarantee that? No, because if you have super low phosphate, then you're not going to be able to grow bacteria um, and, or if you have super low nitrate. Now he's the, the, the person writing in said they had an outbreak of what earlier? Um, it just says an algae bloom about two weeks after he added them or he or she added them. Okay, but they've been running it for six months. So that was a long time ago. Yeah. So we don't really have enough data in this case to to make uh, really an intelligent guess. We or we need we need to know if there's high nitrates or phosphates in the system, uh, why the bio pellets aren't um, turning brown and sticking. I would say it's probably uh, already a low nutrient system, but we just don't know. Yep. Okay. And as always, if he answered your question and you want to write back in and give us some more information so we can better answer it, give us some um, numbers or all that stuff, please do. Don't hesitate. Yep. Okay. Moving on. Question number three. I just dosed refresh into my 93 gallon mixed reef. I turned off the skimmer, but I also have a supplementary, 
supplemental canister filter that runs carbon and Seachem Purigen. Do I have to take this offline too? Uh, the carbon is fine. The purigen I would uh, remove or or take the whole thing offline. But if you're going to take it offline, you should drain it for what you know, drain it from water, drain the water out of it. Sorry, and uh, open it up so it doesn't become anaerobic. If you leave the water in your canister filter, it'll go anaerobic, and then when you turn it on, you might be putting uh, bad water into your tank. But uh, Refresh and carbon are fine. Um, Purigen uh, is is I just it's not my favorite thing. You should probably it, it can affect uh, the bacteria. All right, moving on to number four. Ooh, I like this one. It's a recommendation. Can you, in one of your next podcasts, talk about the red field ratio and how to influence the heterotrophic bacteria? In my reef tank, I always measure phosphates from 0.1 to 0.3, and I have to constantly add a lot of nitrate, increasing products because they quickly drop below five milligrams per liter. The glass in my tank has a green film each day that I have to clean. What could be the problem? I use a zeolite reactor and have an efficient protein skimmer. I dose heterotrophic bacteria twice a week that I feed every day with liquid carbon dosing. In the bottom, I have a half inch of aragonite sand. Well, here's a candidate for the Swiss army knife method. There's a <laughs> lot of information in there. So first off, uh, we, we can do a podcast on the red field ratio. I think we need to. Uh, Redfield is a professor Redfield who, through a lot of work, determined this. Wow, well, I don't remember the dates. I want to say the 40s and 50s, but I could be wrong on that. Anyways, determined that in marine phytoplankton, there was this ratio between carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Uh, and if you got outside that ratio, you would start growing, say, cyanobacteria. Um, but, and, and there's a lot more, and we'll talk about that. But he, here's here's the problem, everyone. And, and I see this red field ratio all the time in the aquarium. The red field ratio applies to phytoplankton. It does not apply to bacteria. And that's the misapplication of the red field ratio which we'll talk about uh, in our podcast that we'll do soon. Well, we'll do, I'm not sure about soon. We're pretty busy in the next couple of weeks, but we'll do that. But the, the other issue is that when you're doing red field ratios, you're measuring total carbon, total phosphorus, and total nitrogen. And unfortunately, there's just no way that you can do that with any of the equipment that, that's available to the hobbyist. To do total carbon and total night total organic carbon, <laughs> the machine's fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> oh sheesh! Yeah, total organic carbon analyzer. If, if you've got that kind of cash sitting around, you should be having someone take care of your tank, unless you really just love it. Yes, to um, do that stuff. <laughs> and to do the you know what's called shell doll or kel doll, but it's Swedish, so it's a soft K J shell doll uh, nitrogen. That's some nasty uh, stuff you have to put in there to, to dissolve everything. And you, you cook it at very high temperatures. Uh, so you don't have the equipment. So your ratio of what you're measuring, because what your test kit's measuring is SRP, soluble reactive phosphate. And that's a very, very small portion, maybe less than 2% of the total phosphate in your system, because phosphate is mostly stuck to stuff. Um, and you're measuring nitrate, which is, again, a very small part of, or could be a very small part of the total nitrogen. So we'll push that aside and go that and go in there deeper. Now, to, um, you're, get, you're always getting green algae on the glass. And I think that's probably because... 
We don't know how deep the tank is, but if, you, if you're growing a lot of green algae on the front glass, that to me is an indicator of your lights. And your lights are probably high in the blue spectrum, and that causes algae to grow. The blue spectrum is what algae and the symbiotic algae and the corals love. And unfortunately, you well, fortunately, there's a you don't need all that blue. A lot of people just run their blue at 100%. Only if your tank is super deep do you need that. If you're having lots of algae issues, having algae on that front glass, you crank your blue channel down under 50%. If you don't have any corals, crank it down under 30 or you know 20% because that is just stimulating algae growth. What were other parts of the question, Hillary? Sorry. Can't remember. Um, I, I think that was primarily it, just what's causing the problem. Yeah, I would say that's it. Um, and and this is typically what I have found is that people, because uh, because nobody tells them, you don't need all this blue light. Um, the blue is what corals and, and uh, algae and, and things need, phytoplankton, because the blue is the wavelength that penetrates the deepest. Uh, but you, if you've got a 12 or 24, you know, 12 to 24 inch tank, you don't need your blue a hundred percent. Yep. Okay. Question number five, I would like to use your refresh and waste away recipe to get rid of green hair algae. I have a pistol shrimp and a cleaner shrimp. If I follow the directions precisely, will these be in danger? I can't tell for sure if you're warning me not to use it at all or just not to overdose. Uh, so what the, uh, email, the person who emailed this or contacted us about this question is talking about is on the back of the refresh, we put a warning that refresh may harm uh, shrimp and uh, certain invertebrates. And we don't truthfully know the reason why, but when we first develop products, we uh, dose them at very high doses to see what the effects might be on animals. And what we found is that super high doses, you know, 10, 20 X, 20, 10, 20 times the normal dose that the refresh may kill um, these animals. And so we put a warning on there. Why? Because history is experience has shown us that people don't measure precisely. People don't measure at all. <laughs> I think we had that with another person who wrote in and they, they admitted they overdosed, which is nice. You know, it, it happens. Um, so it's, to, it's a, just a warning that, you know, don't abuse the product. Will it kill your animals? The answer is probably not. But truthfully, can I 100% absolutely guarantee it? I cannot. Because again, every system is different. You may think this is how much water you have and you don't. Then how do you measure and things like that? So we just want you to be careful. Um, and what I would do in that case is start with the less of a dose. Start with 25% or 50% of the normal dose and observe how you how it is your animal doing okay? Um, and then and then adjust from there. I will also add to like each system is different, but animals are also just as different. You know, you could say, hey, this is what the average cleaner shrimp is supposed to do. It's not supposed to have any reactions. And like you could have the one oddball that doesn't fit the mold. So there's always that as well. Right. And one thing as we're talking about refresh and waste away. Um, cause I know we had this once Hillary is you add them separately. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. I think, I think that might be the very next question that you need to answer this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Next question. Hillary. Next please. question. <laughs> I'm on day nine of refresh waste away combo pack for my system and encountered a cloud after about four hours of dosing. The UV and skimmer are back on, but since this is the first time I've encountered this phenomena, I'm not sure what to expect. I have roughly calculated 300 gallons of water volume in the system. I'm fighting both red cyano and green hair algae, which have been going on. I kind of honestly can't remember about eight months now. And this is my second attempt at dosing. 
Okay, so there's lots going on with this. But first off, what I wanted to say is you do not add refresh and waste away at the same time. Uh, it is refresh first, wait a day, refresh again, wait a day, maybe even refresh a third time. And the refresh will knock back, generally knock back um, whatever nuisance organism you're targeting. And then the idea is to start using the waste away to get rid of all that organic material. Because if you don't get rid of the underlying cause, you're, you're just going to repeat and repeat and have eight months of a mess, which sounds like this uh, person does. And now, now why do you have this mess? Um, oh, um, I just remembered something here. Cause there, that, uh, sorry, we're going to, we're going to go back a little bit. One of those All earlier right. questions, was it the one right, be, right before said they're dosing liquid carbon? Yes. Um, hold on. Yeah. Question number four. Yeah. If, if you have hair algae, if you have especially cyanobacteria, don't be dosing liquid carbon. Why? Because liquid carbon isn't preferentially um, taken up by the, you know, any of those heterotrophic bacteria that you're adding or you think you're adding, because not all heterotrophic bacteria products are the same. Uh, and it's kind of, the, it, it is a numbers game. If your tank is full of cyanobacteria and you're dosing liquid carbon, guess who's going to get most of that liquid carbon? The cyanobacteria, because they're there and they want that too. So dosing liquid carbon by itself is generally not a strategy to get rid of cyanobacteria. And now going jumping forward to our question, what we normally would say is if you have a bad case of cyano or green hair algae, physically remove as much as you can because it, it, it is a numbered game. If you have a huge amount of this and they're established, a lot of what you attempt to do is just going to be counteracted by the fact that you've got so many of these, you know, they're, they're, they've taken over. So you got to try to level the playing field by getting in there and doing some work and, and removing as much as you can, then adding the refresh to help finish the job and then get rid of the organics. Cyanobacteria generally grow in more polluted systems, systems with a lot of cyano or, systems and, and that that have a lot of organics in their substrate, which can be some brands of live sand. They're putting a lot of organics in there, but the organics are, are going to feed the cyanobacteria. And then, of course, your water quality parameters are pretty off, and we don't even have to get into the red scale about this because red field ratio, it's most likely that you have a fair amount of phosphate in the system. Uh, you may or may not have much nitrate with cyanobacteria, but with green hair algae, if you've got a you know phosphate above. 0.1 to 0.3, and you've got nitrate in the 2030s, and lots of light, lots of blue light, you're pretty much going to grow green hair algae. And that gets back to, if you've had these things for eight months, there's something basically wrong with your system in terms of, and, it's, and I'm not, there's no fault, there's no blame, it's just, there's something, it's lighting, it's filtration, it's the substrate, there's just something there that is allowing these organisms to, to overrun and, and, and rule the system. And it would take some emails to get back you know, to figure out what it is. But if you've got a lot of organics in the, in the substrate, that's not good. Um, you, you know, when you say this, what did they say? The skimmer was running perfectly or something. Um, they they turned the UV and the skimmer on. Um, I think once they had the the cloud. Oh, one yeah, you want to do that, but having that cloud 
that pretty much says you've got tons of organics and tons of nutrients and combine that with some light with a skimmer and a UV. I mean, here, here's the issue, uh, which I've said several times, not a big fan of UV and don't run that skimmer 24 hours. So, so what, what's happened in the last, the unintentionally, what's been happening in the last eight months, educated guess here is the UV and uh, the skimmer have basically made the water sterile of bacteria. The water has very little bacteria in it, but you've got all this light and all these nutrients and all these organics. So that's, you're, you're going to grow green hair algae and cyanobacteria because there's no competitors in the system because you've unintentionally eliminated the competition to the green hair algae and the cyano, which is bacteria in the water column. And I'm not, I don't think this person did that, but, you know, combine that because I know we've had people in the past that go, oh, I'm going to add organic, you know, liquid carbon to this. Well, you don't have any, because I don't have any bacteria, but running the skimmer in the UV is killing all the bacteria. So all that liquid carbon is just feeding the green hair algae and the cyano. And so you've just gone down the rabbit hole. Um, so my first thing would be clean it up as much as you can. Stop running the UV and uh, turn off the skimmer a couple hours at least each day with a timer, dial down the blue lights and, and start adding like our waste away or some of our gels, our waste away gels to get the bacterial population up. Not going to work overnight, but it's better than going for eight months looking at a tank of green hair algae and cyanobacteria. Yep. And I think probably applicable too is take a good close look at how much you're feeding on a regular basis because that could also cause problems. Yeah, we don't have any nitrate or phosphate data from this person, do we? Nope. Okay, well, best of luck with that. Hopefully that gets squared away because uh, eight months of green hair algae is rather annoying. Yeah, and we'd like you to stay in the in the hobby. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. I had a green hair algae issue probably a year ago and I let it get out of control for a while because I kind of liked how it looked like it almost had like this nice flow. Like there was grass in the tank. It was like, no, this has to go. Sure. Hillary sets up a tank just to grow. Now, if you set up a tank just to grow a green hair algae on purpose, you know, you would fail. That's just the way. Yeah. It is. Right. <laughs> just, yeah. That never works. Okay, where were we? Let's see. All right, question number seven. I purchased some of the dry purple rock that comes seeded with bacteria. Will the bacteria in that rock compete with the bacteria that comes in Dr. Tim's one and only? Will this cause my cycling to take a lot longer? Well, I hate that. Well, I don't want to knock any product, but uh, chances are of you having dried nitrifying bacteria are slim and none, to be completely honest. Um, nitrifiers, and, unless that dry rock was really cultured and, and fed tons of ammonia and got a biofilm, um, the chances are of there being any nitrifying bacteria on that is pretty zero because nitrifiers just don't do that. I mean, if it was kept a little damp, you have to establish the colony. You know, I'm not sure how you would do that because um, all this, I'm, a, I'm a, well, I'm making the assumption this is man-made purple rock. Is that, do you think that's a correct assumption, Hillary? Mm. I would say yes. Yeah. Um, because if you get live rock, you know, directly from the ocean, which, which is harder and harder, but you know, that has all sorts of, of organisms and biofilms and all sorts of stuff on it. And companies try to duplicate that, but it takes a long time to you do know that. too, what they could be talking to. I worked at a store where they would take the dry purple rock and they would put it in bins and seed it. So maybe like, maybe that's what they're talking about yeah i mean that that could work um you know if it's if it's been in a system and it's and and that what is 
I, you know, I, I call that cured. You know, it's it's been percolating a little bit and growing some biofilm and stuff like that. Um, but let's let's get off that. Let's assume that there is biofilm on there. It's nitrifiers. Will it interfere with our uh, one and only live nitrifying bacteria? And the answer is no. Our our bacteria aren't foreign. They come just they come from aquariums. They're the right ones we've extracted years ago from aquariums. We test them. Uh, you know, run, run a DNA test on to make sure they culture stay the same because you can't make an assumption with bacteria. Um, so they won't interfere. They would help supplement um, the cycling. Uh, what what you might find is if you're going to use live sand, live rock that you're getting from uh, a dealer or something that, that, that's been wet, I would set the system up, let it run, get it all going, let it run a day or two. And especially if you're doing a fishless cycle, measure the ammonia before you add any of the ammonia drops. Because there will be... Or there's organics on there, no doubt. And the, if the organics were um, substances or, or biofilms dry out, that will start to decay and the bacteria will um, decompose that into ammonia. So you may already have some ammonia in the system. We see that a lot with live sand. It, it puts a lot of ammonia into the system. And then if you don't measure that beforehand and you add our ammonia drops, you've added a little bit too much ammonia to the system. So if you're going to use any of those, you should measure the ammonia concentration before you add uh, ammonia drops to the system. Yep, exactly. Okay, question number eight. I used Aquaon water conditioner one week ago. I plan on doing Dr. Tim's ammonia and one and only in a few days. Aquion claims to detoxify the ammonia. Will this ruin my planned attempt to cycle given the time has passed since using it? You know, we really don't recommend uh, any type of ammonia remover if you're going to use um, our ammonia because I mean, it's kind of counterproductive uh, and bacteria. Will it ruin it? No, unless you're overdosing. And by overdosing, I mean some people don't have patience. Okay, you, you've treated the water. If it gets rid of the ammonia, if it's a water treatment that gets rid of ammonia, like our aqua cleanse, it's probably going to get rid of the chlorine and chloramine, which you definitely need to get rid of. Um, but then people start to panic. They add the bacteria, but things aren't working fast enough. And so they start adding ammonia removers, and that's where the trouble starts. Uh, a one dose to get the tank going is fine. One dose in the morning, one dose in the evening, every day is not fine. So don't over rely uh, and use the any ammonia removing chemical as a crutch. Give the bacteria some time uh, to establish and to start working, and then you'll have a much more stable biofilter instead of a trying to conquer ammonia through chemistry because that's just not going to work and it's going to be aggravating to you. Exactly. Okay, question number nine. I bought 180 gallons worth of one and only for reef tank and I still can't get this thing to cycle after four weeks. What can you recommend? I went and used the raw shrimp method, dry rock, and 40 pounds of live sand for a 75 gallon saltwater tank. The ammonia is low, the nitrite and nitrates are through the ceiling. No, no phosphate data? Nope, actually I don't think, aside from the size of the tank and the amount of one and only, there's no numbers. So the key here is, to, to factors that I'm that I hear is they used live sand and they used a dead fish originally, which is decaying. And the live sand, we I just mentioned that is decaying. And so what is happening is you're growing a lot of heterotrophic bacteria. And without any more data, I would say that this tank kind of has a phosphate block. 
uh, meaning that if the phosphate gets super low, the nitrifying bacteria are not going to grow very fast. All organisms need phosphate. And this is why if you've looked at the videos, or you've heard my podcast, I always talk about don't add competitors when you're cycling. And this can be the issue here because definitely had competitors because the whole idea of adding a, a dead fish is heterotrophic bacteria start to decompose and break down the dead fish organic and produce ammonia. And that ammonia then feeds the nitrifiers. But the issue is that most sea salts don't have phosphate because people don't want to be adding phosphate to their systems and the ROD water removes the phosphate. So you already start off with low phosphate and by growing heterotrophic bacteria, the phosphate levels can get so low that the nitrifiers really can't grow. So it would be nice to have a phosphate number, but I would say adding a little phosphate, get the dead fish out of there. Um, would would help stimulate this tank. The ammonia guys are growing a little bit, but the phos the nitrite, which are oxidizing bacteria, <clears throat> excuse me, which are slow growing anyways, you know, they're they're at the end of the line and there's no phosphate. I would say there's very little to no phosphate in this tank. And these guys, the bacteria just can't grow. So. Okay. Good advice. All right. Now, this next one that I have isn't so much a question, but something that I thought I might address. So we had somebody write in and tell us that they used our ammonia and another brand of nitrifying bacteria to start up their tank. And they were very, very frustrated that our ammonia is not working. Could you address this? Our ammonia is not working. Mm -hmm. So, uh, not all nitrifying products are the same. Okay. The, the, the fact is I mentioned this in a three part series that I wrote, uh, for coral magazine. It was the end of last year, beginning of this year. And I had an outside lab do, you know, genomic testing on a large number of competitor products. And most of these products, folks, don't have nitrifiers in them. So it's not the ammonia. The ammonia, ammonia is ammonia. Your ammonia is staying high because that's what you did when you added ammonia drops. You added ammonia. There's plenty of ammonia in our ammonia drops. Um, but not all nitrifier products are equal. And some of them are, are water. Some of them are nitrifiers. Enzymes aren't going to cut it. You really need to deal with a company uh, that that grows and knows nitrifiers. So don't equate. Um, there's only one Dr. Tim's product. It's our one and only. It's the only one that I endorse. It's what I have been doing for twenty, nearly thirty years. Okay, we, we, we do a little bit and you know, we don't do everything, but the things we do, we do really well. And if it comes to nitrifiers, uh, this is what we do. Do they work every time? No, nitrify, even our nitrifying bacteria, they are living organisms. You have to treat them as living organisms. They have preferences, systems, you know, water qualities where they work and they don't work. Uh, we don't send out bad batches because we get that a lot. Things can happen. We're not perfect and we're here to help. Um, but realize that uh, we're the only ones that really grow the right combination of bacteria for your system. That's basically the truth of the matter. So it isn't the ammonia, it's your bacteria. How's that, Hillary? I think that works. All right, we got one last one. We've had so many questions. And, and I still you know, have. What was yesterday? Well, the last session that we did, which was yesterday, I'm not sure when this yeah. was getting published, but somebody said, you know, get down and get technical and go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> um, I don't think they said rabbit hole, but uh, 
if you want to get into the details of what we grow in, in this whole thing, because nitrifying bacteria have been around for a long, long time, um, go to our website. I think I, I know we are. I'm the only one that has ever published peer reviewed scientific papers. You know, member of the American Society for Microbiology uh, published peer reviewed papers in, in uh, environmental microbiology, applied in environmental biology. And you can download those papers and uh, read all the work that we did. Um, cause you know, I had a, people helping me want to acknowledge them. Um, but just what we were looking at, what we were doing in, in the, the research behind this, this isn't something, cause I, I, I hate the term when people say it's snake oil, there's real science behind this is like I said, is it going to work hundred percent of the time? No, but we can figure out reasons why almost hundred percent of the time and we can work to fix it. Um, so, uh, there is science behind what we do and we're open on what that science is and it's published out there in peer reviewed scientific journals. Yep. And two, I should like the science changes. Science doesn't stay the same. Like we're always learning and growing. And along those same lines, I know we've talked about this, but I think it might be good to put on our list of topics for a podcast is like, let's go through your resume and sit and talk about all of the things that you've done in your career, because like, I only know bits and pieces, but it blows my mind every single time, all of the stuff that you've done. And I'm sure there's probably more that I don't know about, but I think that will kind of lend to this. Like you make we, bacteria we, we because you're good at making bacteria. Like you, you've put in the work and you stand behind it. Yeah. We're going to do pictures, travel with travel through Dr. Tim's life. If you have pictures, that would be fantastic. I will, I, <laughs> I, I will edit that video so you can you can listen to the podcast and then you can go on YouTube and you can watch it with the photos. <laughs> okay, do we have? There's time one to... pic. Well, there's one picture where very young and because I'll make it fast. My uncle told me I had to remove the gravel every month and clean the tank, which of course is absolutely rotten advice. And so I got the fish in the bucket, and the family dog went fish diving. Like apple, um, yeah. Oh no! <laughs> I saved oh, the no. fish. <laughs> okay. Yes. I was like, All we right. cannot well, end on that note. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I've done a, I've done every stupid thing in the world, folks. You learn by experience. Yeah, it's true. All right. Do we have time for one more? Yes, question? Yes, we have time for one more question. Okay. Question number eleven, our last one of the day. Hello, I ordered Refresh Marine from Chewy to help deal with some problems in my reef tank. And when the bottle arrived, the contents were brown. I notified Chewy and they sent a second bottle. And again, the contents were still brown. Is this normal? Yes, Refresh is brown. Different bacteria, different culture method. Uh, but yes, Refresh is not a clear liquid. It is not just water. Uh, so it has a, a brown slightly muddy when, when you shake it up because that's the bacteria in there you know it always gets me how people some companies sell this crystal clear water and it's full of bacteria huh yeah i don't think so uh so yeah it's it's brown our one and only when you shake it up is kind of a tannish you know you can't see through it milky color this is a little clear but it is definitely a brown i would say root beer color and it just has to goes back to what ingredients are used to grow those specialized bacteria that are in that system, in that product. Yep. I think we have some video clips from when we uh, filmed all the Amazon videos of like pouring the liquids in there and seeing the different colors. I need to go back and pull those and share them. Yeah, I think so. so. All right. Well, those are all the questions for today. All right. I have more questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get to you today, but they will be the first ones that we cover on our next Q&A for August. Okay, quick recap. We got the American Cichlid Society and three other clubs next week in Louisville. It's going to be nuts. Uh, Aquashella in uh, Chicago, right, is coming up. And Dallas. Dallas? 
you have Dallas and it's like the third and fourth, I think. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Magna at the end of August. So uh, lots of things to do. We're not even going to mention the reptile shows where everything crawls and wiggles and uh, even Doc. <laughs> I, I had a story, but I don't think we can end on that story. So. Also, don't forget about Reef Palooza, California. Yes, that's true. Be there in uh, three or four weeks. Yes, I'm so, so excited. Uh, check our calendar. I'll update that on the website. We'll have somebody at all these things and yep. come by and uh, say hi. Yep. And I got to say, if you have extra time, if you're going to Reef Palooza, California, there's some really cool aquariums in the area. The um, Aquarium of the Pacific is in Long Beach and Santa Monica um, Pier. If you go under there at the base of that pier, there's another really cool aquarium, Heal the Bay Aquarium. So if you've got extra yep. time, go check those out. And then down in Orange County, they've got the aquarium there at the uh, uh, Sea Turtle Rescue or something like that. Oh, gosh. Oh, man, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there. All right. Need yeah. to tack on an extra day or so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. This has been another session of Dr. Tim's uh, Aquatics podcast. Thanks for listening.